Welcome to the Leadership Blueprint Podcast, where we feature top designers and entrepreneurs and share their inspiring stories and leadership ideas. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, guys, thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Uh, this is part of a bigger series that we've titled Protecting Your Practice. And our topic today is going to be construction disputes, three pivotal contract provisions that are a must for design professionals. And our guest today, we're really lucky to have Chad Schifrin with us. He's partner at a law firm, Lori and Brennan. And Chad specializes in construction disputes and litigation on large projects such as stadiums, high rises, and complex construction projects all across the country. So, Chad, thanks so much for joining us today, man. Really appreciate it. Zach, thanks for having me. Really excited about doing this and, and appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about a little construction law. This will be fun. Absolutely. It's, a, it's an interesting topic. You know, it's it's something that is actually the most requested by, by our clients because they understand how important this stuff is. It's kind of Greek. It's kind of written in legalese, right? Uh, but I mean, they're signing these contracts daily, right? And and I don't have to tell you that you're seeing it on a regular basis. So this framework that you put together that we're going to go through today is just kind of three, three ideas that, that we'll just kind of talk a little bit about. And maybe we can shed a little more light on this uh, for some architects and engineers. Right. Well, I, I think it's helpful. And it's good to know the, the perspective of the attorney when the dispute happens. Because as I said to you, how we ended up with these three provisions that we're going to speak about today is when I get a call from a client uh, who has a problem in a dispute, um, I told you, well, the three, uh, I look for three uh, provisions right away. And three provisions we'll talk about are, well, what's the dispute resolution provisions of mediation, arbitration, litigation. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, prevailing party uh, attorney's fees provisions and consequential damages. And, and we'll go through each and I'll explain why each of those is so important in, in resolving disputes. And there, there are issues that, uh, you know, every time I have the discussion with the client, they say, I wish I thought of that and considered it right before I signed the contract. So I really think that these three provisions that, that we highlight um, will make it easier for, for your clients and, and anyone in the construction industry to make sure they look at those three before they sign the contract, just in case the dispute happens, um, because they, they're, they're important. Absolutely. Now, so that's a great place to start. So for our purposes here, we'll jump right in with uh, dispute resolution. And, you know, we're going to assume we'll, we'll even kind of look at this from this is actually happening, right? So from our end, our architect or engineer client ha has submitted a claim, they've had a demand of money or services against them. And this is going to be resolved in one fashion or another. So can you just kind of take us down arbitration litigation, just like quick definitions of kind of what those are? Sure. Um, well, well, first, I mean, our, our arbitration is a private um, outside of court. It's essentially of your binding arbitration, which is what we're talking about here. It's having a, a trial with a, a private citizen forming the, the decision, and that would be the arbitrator. So right. you can set your own rules. You'll generally go through the, uh, uh, you can set the rules however you want, but typically there's the uh, AAA or, or, or JAMS or other um, outfits out there that will administer the arbitration and help you select an arbitrator and go through the arbitration process. That keeps it totally outside of the court system. It's paid for by the parties, something separate from uh, uh, litigation. Uh, right. So to contrast arbitration to litigation, litigation is you're walking into court, your taxpayer funded court system that we have, um, it, you know, throughout the country, uh, you'll have your trial court. You One big difference between arbitration and uh, litigation is you'll have your appeal rights. If you don't like the result of the at litigation, you can appeal up to the appellate court. And then if you don't like it there, you can try to appeal up to the uh, Supreme Court level. At arbitration, there's very little uh, appellate review. Um, the other uh, interesting decision that, that you have to make in litigation, and this decision is often made at the time of drafting the contract, is whether you want it to have a, want to have a jury trial or a bench trial, a bench trial being a, a trial by, by the uh, judge and not have a, a jury of your peers. Right. Got it. So that's, you touched on a number of different things there. Um, arbitration. And we talked to you, you mentioned binding arbitration versus non-binding arbitration, right? I, I know on my end, I typically see binding. Do you ever see uh, anything other than binding, non-binding arbitration? 
We don't. I mean, non-binding arbitration is, is some courts will kind of uh, encourage it. If you're in court, they'll send you over to non-binding arbitration as a way to settle a dispute. But that is typically for low dollar amount disputes. Uh, the construction industry, just the nature of construction disputes, you end up with higher dollar amounts and thresholds um, that, that typically don't lend themselves to non-binding arbitration. It'd be too expensive. The party's just going to appeal it. It's not going to get the resolution that you want. So no, for our purposes and for, for the general construction industry, um, it is almost always binding arbitration. Right, right. And so the, the positives of arbitration, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I mean, I think we're talking speed. Right, we're talking getting this done in a in a fairly reasonable time frame. Is that? Well, I, I laugh because it, sometimes so that's what the client's <laughs> expectation is. But but if you don't have a well defined arbitration, depending who the arbitrator is, it, it can last for years and go on for a lot longer than a court case. Right. But the, the way I look at it, and, and it's it's really your can you know the way you'd look at a, a construction project in, in some ways is you know time, which you were just mentioning. Then you got to talk about the money because there's big differences in money and spending for the arbitration. And then the third piece, which is really well, is, is, is kind of the, what I call the, the leverage, putting yourself in the best position to succeed and get the optimal result that you would have from the, the right dispute resolution forum. Um, so let me talk. Let's talk through those three issues, I think, and compare and contrast and tell you a little bit about uh, items that you should be thinking about to put in your construction contracts as, as you go through the dispute resolution provision. Um, and it's also a good point time to, to mention, we're skipping over the mediation and the meeting of principles. And there's a bunch of other provisions you can put in there that, that I'd recommend, but we're going to go jump ahead to right. the, the real dispute. Right. So for, you know I mean? for our purposes, for our listeners, we will assume that you've had good faith negotiations that didn't, we couldn't make anything happen there. And then maybe we went through mediation, you know, maybe not, maybe we've skipped ahead, but for our purposes, we'll jump right into kind of the two main players. Right, so so let's talk about time first. Typically, arbitration should be uh, far more expedient than the court process. Um, part of that is you should put parameters on your arbitration provision though, so that you make sure it proceeds timely. Some of those parameters include that you get a hearing within a certain number of days or months, depending on the complexity of the project, um, that you can put into that arbitration provision that will require the arbitrator to enforce that and get yourself to a hearing within 90 days or six months or a year, depending on what, and the next issue we're going to get to is how much discovery you want to have in the arbitration, because again, you can control uh, the the discovery process and arbitration by agreement, and that the, that agreement should be set forth in the construction contract. So the real benefit of arbitration is, as long as you define your discovery, and, and, and even in better cases, you put a time limit on, on how long uh, from, from the uh, arbitration demand to the actual hearing that you put in that contract, you can get to a hearing much, much faster than you can in a court of law. In court, you're subject to the rules of civil procedure, and depending on, on the party's intentions and, and how they want to go about litigating the case, and quite frankly, the court's own docket schedule of when you can get a trial date, whether it's bench or jury, uh, you're really at the whim of the court system and the judge. So that is why, uh, especially more populous areas and cities, those dockets tend to move you know, relatively slowly. There are exceptions. So what I was going to say, you know, especially in a uh, federal court, they, they can move uh, much, much quicker. Um, and on, on the flip side, the, the arbitrations can move slower. So the point is, the message is, if you choose arbitration and time is important, and, and a lot of clients look and say, I don't want to be spending months and months and years on attorney's fees. I just want to get to a hearing. Then you need to define that. And then, then that's a reason to arbitrate. But make sure that you put some terms in there to make sure that that uh, expected expedited hearing occurs. I want to say terms and they're put in the contract. Um, so anyway, uh, that is time. That is the time consideration. It really is uh, all else being equal. It, it weighs towards arbitration, but you need to make sure you draft the provision right because there are plenty of uh, situations where you have a complex construction project and willing arbitrators that that want to allow all the discovery in if there's no parameters that are defined and they let you take as many depositions as you want and 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 let parties delay, 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 and, and push off the uh, the hearing date, 
and you don't really have any recourse. The arbitrator can do what they can do. And I've been involved in plenty of arbitrations where the hearing date was several years after the arbitration demand. So you just, you got to be aware of it so that your expectations are met. And the best way to meet your expectations is uh, articulate it and put it in the contract. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to assume, I mean, and this is kind of the point of all this is that we can get all this in the contract and it's laid out. We're not, we're not trying to, uh Oh, we, we've, we've had a claim. We're in the middle of this and now we're setting the rules of the game. That's a little too late. Right. Right. And the next issue then comes to money because one of the, the stereotypical cons of arbitration is that it's expensive. You have to pay the arbitrators. Arbitrators are typically, uh, experienced lawyers that have been arbitrating for a while. Sometimes they'll be engineers or architects and others, but for the most part, it's typically um, lawyers who, who are highly paid and, and they have a high hourly rate and they pay you by the hour, uh, or sorry, they bill you by the hour. So in, in arbitration panels are typically either one uh, panel member or three panel members. So again, that's gonna have a, a huge, huge, huge price uh, uh, difference uh, right. between it and, uh, you need to make a decision of, 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 and again, this goes into the contract and the terms. Maybe you want to only have a three panel arbitration if it's uh, above a certain dollar amount, a dollar threshold that makes it worthwhile. Right. Um, alternatively, there may be no dollar threshold that you want a three panel arbitration and you want to have a single arbitrator. Again, you got to put in some provisions for how you choose that arbitrator, but I won't go into that. But that's one of the key issues on, on money is one or three person arbitrator. The second key issue, which is you're trying to save litigation, potentially uh, walk the line of, of not spending too much on, on litigation expenses, um, but at the same time being prepared for hearing. So that's the, the discovery process. That is the dollar suck of all the document gathering, of all the document review, of loading those documents with the e-discovery vendors, of, of however you do that review, taking depositions, the written uh, discovery and so forth and how much time and effort and, and, and the significant cost that's involved in that. What I would recommend is, and, and it depends, you know, the, again, complexity of these construction projects and the amount of money at stake, but streamlining your arbitration, and taking that discretion out of the arbitrator's hands and putting into the construction contract a limitation on the number of depositions, mm. potentially eliminating the um, written discovery Again, unless the parties agree otherwise, they think it's going to be efficient because a lot of times you end up spending a, a ton of money with with uh, interrogatory requests and, and non-answers back and forth that, that's not getting anybody anywhere for, for the crux of the issues and really get, getting to, to the meat of the disputes. So limiting um, the written discovery, limiting the amount of depositions, if any, I've done a, a plenty of arbitrations without any depositions and and hey, the, the arbitrator gets to hear everything and they hear it straight from the witness's mouth. And, and do you really need a deposition transcript to know what they're going to say to have an efficient um, arbitration? Reasonable minds can you know disagree on that and, and, and so forth. But the point is that you want to be intentional about what that dispute resolution looks like. And if money is an important issue for the client in, in looking ahead to a potential dispute, uh, limiting that discovery, putting it in writing in the in the dispute resolution provision is a, a good way to do that. Right. Um, and then we get to that last factor, which which as I said was leverage, which is what type of client are you? Who are you in the community? What 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 are your expectations and, and ability to to fund litigation? Do you have insurance coverage and so forth? For what is your best venue? Um, do you want to have appeal rights? As I mentioned earlier, um, that is a a really important issue. Um, for, for clients, uh, for, for obvious reasons. Uh, you, if you end up with a single arbitrator, even a three panel ar ar arbitrator, which gives you a little more leeway that you're convincing two out of three, and you just have rogue arbitrators who, you know, they're gonna do what they wanna do and you have to live with it without any appeal, without any review of the record of whether it was um, the, the, the right decision, or, or I shouldn't even say the right decision, a decision within the, the realm of reasonableness or meeting the standards of, of the law, whatever the, the standard is that you want to look at. Um, it's, it's a very important consideration on, on that appeal issue. Right. The other can issue talk, is... Yeah, can I interrupt you real quick, Chad? When you're talking about that, one of the knocks that I have heard on arbitration, binding arbitration as a dispute resolution is arbitrators in an effort to keep things speedy have a tendency to what we'll call King Solomon split the baby, right? We've got three parties, five parties, 10 parties involved. 
And, and rather than spend tons and tons of time, like we were kind of talking about, um, you know, in, in the court system, we're going to make a pretty quick judgment here. And if you're a client that is coming into this thinking that maybe you have zero fault or a fairly low percentage of fault, you might get hit with 33% of fault just because that's the way it shook out and it's, it's binding, right? There's no appeal rights there. Can you talk just a little bit about that? Sure. It's, it's always a concern. And, and, and there's, the, I've heard that from, from a number of clients and there's validity to it. There, there's no doubt about it. The flip side of that is this though, you know, judges and juries can do that as well. Um, I, I don't know that it's unique to arbitrators. I guess they have a little more power and, and they don't have to worry about the review, the, the appellate review. So people think they're more likely to play a little Solomon's justice, but that's, you know, just the reality of, of taking a, a dispute up uh, and and not resolving it and taking it to a decision maker. Um, the other risk is the decision maker goes fully on one side when you're expecting some Solomon's justice or something. It's, those are those are all inherent risks of of not resolving a case short of a final determination. I'd also add it's that's one of the the reasons why vetting of the arbitrator is so important. It, it really is. Uh, you know, those in the industry have either experience before the arbitrators or, or resources to, to it, times you can interview the arbitrator before you, you retain them and so forth. But you, you have to, again, depending on what your, your interests are and what the needs are and what you're looking for out of that final decision, um, those, are, those are things that you should be you know, cognizant of and who, who and why you're selecting the arbitrator or arbitrators. And that, that's a very important process. Awesome, that was great. I didn't mean to cut you off in the leverage. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, no. I was just going to say the, the the dispute forum setting aside time and money may, may be very significant to um, clients. Uh, arbitration has the benefit of, and, and it's not automatically, but you can you can work and, and put it in there to have it be a confidential proceeding if you want it to be. Mm -hmm. um, the so you have to consider the you know in court the, those are publicly filed documents. I I, I get reports of what was filed. Uh, in my county, every single day, I know everyone that's been named in a lawsuit in, in inside and outside of construction. So it becomes a matter of public record. Um, the other consideration is the juries. Um, if you're a large uh, employer in the area or a, have a good reputation in the area or for whatever reason, you may want a jury trial. Um, if you are someone who, who really just believes in, in in particular the equities of your, your situation of whatever that dispute is. And I know that you don't know that at the time of the contracting, but the way you conduct business and you know where the disputes end up, that you want to present that to a jury rather than a, again, stereotypically, but to you end up with uh, older men or women who have been in the industry for a very long time um, and know the industry and, and make their own assumptions and biases, which is the arbitrators, um, you may want it to have, be a, a lay person who just sees the world as you see it and, or not as you see it, but as, as, as a lay person would see it, who's outside of the industry. And as you explain it to your relatives or whoever else at, at, a, at a family party or friends or whoever, you may want that opportunity to talk to a jury because because that's how you conduct business. So again, those are just additional considerations is what form puts you in the best spot. The, the last point on, on that is it goes back to something you said earlier, where you may want a jury there to help encourage resolution and settlement, that that jury really is a black box is very difficult to predict. And if you, your interests are, look, the reality is most cases settle. And what is going to result in more favorable terms of that settlement is if you think that dispute will ultimately go to a jury, which who knows what's going to happen, as opposed to an arbitrator where the parties tend to think that they have a pretty, not to say they're always right, but they tend to think during the process, oh, this arbitrator who's been in this industry and knows the law this well, they must rule on my side. They're going to love my arguments because they see the world as I do. Both sides kind of get trapped in that. It's just another consideration that clients should consider. Gotcha. Gotcha. That was great. There was a lot to unpack there. Um, that was perfect. So, Yeah. I'm, um, I'm, well, whatever. We'll keep no. going. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna do. You, are you okay jumping into number two, prevailing parties? Yeah. Okay. So we've got uh, prevailing party attorneys fees or attorney provisions, uh, factors that determine whether or not we agree with fee shifting, and and from an insurance standpoint, I tend to ballpark somewhere between sixty as high as eighty percent of any insurance claim is going to be attorneys fees. Right. It is right. going to be 
the the dollar amount that we are paying attorneys and the, the process we just talked about in discovery, right? And and all the proceedings that come along with that. And that adds up very quickly. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I can't stress this enough. And so many clients don't appreciate it or realize it when they're negotiating the contract, the significance of the attorney's fees provision when and if a dispute occurs that doesn't get resolved quickly. Those attorney's fees can, can add up or exceed the, the value of the claim very quickly. It, it's, it's an enormous hammer. Um, if you prevail at, at arbitration or trial and hit the, the other side with attorney's fees, um, in particular, if they're not covered by insurance. Um, and, and all of that leads to incredible, incredible leverage for settlement discussions, um, one way or the other, because you know both sides are going to believe in, in their case, but who, who can handle the exposure of not only with the underlying dispute, but that hammer of those attorney's fees? And what, is that, what does that do to those settlement discussions? Because right. again, sure, you know, most cases settle. That's just the reality of of the world, and in particular of uh, construction disputes. They're very sophisticated parties. They they understand risk. I mean, that's what construction's all about. They know how to uh, deal with the risk, and the uncertainty of a high exposure like attorneys' fees really really does factor into um, settlement discussions and drive settlement oftentimes. And so you really need to think about that of, of whether you're you're better or worse off in a dispute, having a prevailing party attorney's fees provision. Um, we could talk if, if, if you want some of the pros and cons. Yeah, I was gonna say, just, I, yeah, can you do like maybe a couple pros and a couple cons for it? Well, it, it starts with uh, the, the size of the company and, and who your uh, adversary is. I mean, assuming a two party dispute, somebody with very deep pockets is going to leverage a, a prevailing party attorney's fees provision over someone with much smaller pockets where, the, where, the, where dollar for dollar is going to matter a lot more relative to that smaller player. Um, so that is the most obvious consideration. And, and, and the, the next uh, part is, who are your attorneys? Um, because there, there's a big discrepancy in just, you know, quite frankly, how, how certain uh what hourly rates of the size of law firms they use in big law firms they're using small law firms um, on the rate issue also staffing of uh, cases and so forth of what knowledge can you um, get as you negotiate the contract who are those attorneys on the other side of the contract negotiation will give you a pretty good heads up for would I want to be on the other side of an attorney's fees provision because again they're they're not all equal and yeah they're subject to the reasonableness uh, which which a court or arbitrator will review, but you're you're really again looking at a black box where a lot of discretion goes on, and so you, you don't want to uh, bank on oh they'll they'll just cut that big firm attorney's fees down because they're a big law firm that that's not something you want to rely on when you're negotiating right. the contract and anticipating being a dispute. Um, the other aspect of attorney provision that I'd like to introduce is it doesn't have to be a binary decision of either we have a prevailing party provision or we don't. There's, there's a middle ground that uh, clients should really think about, which is having a prevailing parties, uh, prevailing party fee provision with limitations on it. Mm -hmm. And so you can cap that. You can cap it to the, the monetary amount of, of whatever the award is. Um, again, depending on what your goals are in your, your each respective client situation, you could cap it to 50% of what the monetary value is. So then there's a little something you think that that you're, the way you handle your business is you're not gonna end up in litigation unless you're absolutely right and you're chasing somebody. So you wanna make sure you have a fee provision, but you're also not large enough that you ever wanna absorb a huge exposure. So you you can cap it um, and, and have it there because it will have the, the necessary leverage and hammer effect to do something in negotiations. If you're, you know, say you're an architect who owes, who's owed money and has to pursue uh, an owner for money. Um, but you don't want to have the the big exposure, which which occasionally happens when architects sue the owner and the owner was lying down. But now all of a sudden they found an error and omission and they blow this case up and they're like, oh my goodness, now they're just really threatening you with those prevailing party attorney's fees. So again, it's depending so on who you are, you know, and you really think about it, you, you can do that. You could, I mean, in addition to the cap, you can help define what does prevailing party mean? Um, and so you can encourage people to be reasonable by by putting provisions in your prevailing party attorney's fees provision that you have to recover 75% or more of your claim. Well, that's going to discourage owners from 
you know, blowing up their claims. Same for architects or contractors or whoever, because they're going to want to be able to recover that attorney's fees provision and hit that 75% mark. You could do 51%, which is a little more um, the norm, you know, where people think 51% is prevailing and less than that isn't. But you should think about that sliding scale and what your goals are and then try to negotiate that into your contract and not just think to yourself that I either have massive exposure on prevailing parties, attorney's fees, or I don't agree to one and I've none and have to front the costs, even though I, I'm, I feel strongly and I'm right in having to pursue this claim. So those are considerations that um, a lot of clients... Uh, don't think about, but I'm, I'm, we're trying to see what we're seeing more and more of that in, in construction contracts. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And that's, that's actually one of the biggest knocks I've heard on prevailing parties is if it's not defined, what do we, who, who prevailed? Like, how do we, how are we talking about who prevailed? Is it 5149? Is it a dollar amount? Is it if, if you made an accusation against me and I think I'm 0% at fault and you proved I'm at least 1% at fault, then, you know, you, you've won because you, you proved that I am at least a percentage point at fault. I, there's just so much to, there to, to unpack there. So just defining it, right. Just from the beginning. <laughs> well, that's right. And, and again, people in the construction industry, we, we deal with them all the time. They prefer certainty. They, they don't want to have that, that risk, that unknown. And so the, you know, you to, to your point, it's discretionary. The judge is going to decide what, whether right. you, uh, you know, just prevailed or not, uh, right. uh, you know, substantial success on, on the merits or whatever the standard is in the jurisdiction you're in. Um, so yeah, that's that's what we'd encourage the the certainty in the contract, and, and everyone then knows where they stand. Gotcha. Any more thoughts on prevailing parties before we jump into the last one? No, I think that that's good. I mean, no, I, that was that was very that was. There was a lot packed into there, so that was great. Um, last one, very, very, very good, important one to talk about is a waiver of consequential damages. Um, so let's just start. Can we start with just by defining what are consequential damages, right? Right. So in any dispute, and you go to court, you, you got to prove up your liability, entitlement, damages. Typically, breach of contract cases. That's that's what most construction. Uh, disputes are. And on the damages portion of that, to, damages are really uh, segregated into two categories, direct damages and consequential damages. Um, the direct damages are the, the, the damages that directly flow from the breach. So if you have to repair and replace something, what's the repair and replacement cost? Consequential damages don't do... Uh, they're, so they're, they're differentiated because they are reasonably foreseeable from the breach. Mm -hmm. And so consequential damages are, are, are uh, just a step removed from that, that direct damage um, that you'd see. So the, the most common example of consequential damages are lost profits. Right. Right. I, uh, there's a case out here I know you're familiar with, uh, Millennium Tower in San Francisco. Uh, it's a luxury condo building that is uh, leaning. And one of the biggest cases to come out of that, there were some very famous people that owned condominiums in that complex. Uh, Joe Montana, former quarterback of the 49ers being one of them. He sold it to uh, a then San Francisco giant Hunter Pence. And one of the biggest consequ consequential damages to come out of that was this was a building that, that we bought the condo expecting a certain dollar amount. Now it's in the news. Everybody knows about it. There's no way I'm going to sell it for what I bought it for, let alone, you know, make any money on it and have it appreciate the way that real estate should in San Francisco. Therefore, you know, I am bringing suit against you and man, oh man, I mean, that's, that can get expensive real fast, right? There's no doubt about it. And, and that's why th those that don't know or understand what consequential damages are and the exposure that they're accepting and signing a contract, because that reasonable foreseeability test is very broad. Um, the uh, AIA, you know, re reformed their, their contracts where, where they really uh, inserted the waiver of mutual, I'm sorry, the waiver of consequential damages into most contracts. Um, and, and it did that, I think, in the early 90s. If I, I believe I have this right, but but if I don't, it's there. There's a casino case out in New Jersey that's a very uh, famous consequential damages case of, of what could happen. Um, the if I'm remembering it right, I think it was at the Sands Casino in Atlantic City, and a contractor um, ended up getting hit with a lost profits claim that was like 25 times its fee. 
mm. because there was a delay in the opening and the contractor was found to be causing the delay and the casino lost a whole bunch of money. And those mm -hmm. are consequential damages. That was reasonably foreseeable. Um, did the contractor think about that when they were signing the, the contract? Probably not. But, you know, the, the point is that you can get hit with really significant damages of, of whether it's lost profits, whether it's interest on loans, of whether it's uh, a home office overhead type uh, things, but uh, the lost profits, not only for that project, but then there's the next layer of lost profits for future work. If right. a contractor ends up getting stuck on a job and they can't get off and the owner's liable for consequential damages and the, the contractor can show and prove to a reasonable certainty, they would have had this other job and these other profits, but they couldn't do it because of the owner's breach. You're, you're right. looking at, at massive amounts of exposure. Right. We see that in schools not opening on time for the school year. Right. The, the architect or engineer is has made an error in a mission. It's a design uh, flaw and it's pushed construction back. And now the school doesn't open on time. The contractor needs to be there in the fall. They had already planned all of these other jobs that they should be on. And now they're coming back and it just it turns into a mess really quickly. Yeah. And, and so what, what I'd like to educate you know clients about is. Um, one, think about it, know, know what consequential damages are and, and know that it can be a, a massive exposure that it could potentially end up driving disputes and litigation with, with creative uh, and, and good lawyering that, that, that sees that there's no waiver and you can pursue consequential damages. And the doctor realizes, well, well, because of this, what did you lose? And you could end up with really big numbers that end up driving the litigation, which wasn't the, the real reason why the dispute started to begin with. Again, that maybe to your advantage or disadvantage as a client, but you want to be educated as to what that is and, and eyes wide open when you sign that contract. Gotcha. Um, I'd also add that that you want to make sure that your contracts are consistent um, because, as, you know, for architects and, and their mechanical engineer and structural engineer, you want to make sure that that uh, waiver of consequential damages is consistent throughout those contracts. Because even if you have the waiver of consequential damages, you might get sucked into litigation if your mechanical engineer doesn't have the waiver and the owner's then pursuing them, but you can't extricate yourself. You're stuck in there. And even though you could pass down that liability, uh, you're still stuck there, you know, and, right. and, you're, and you're dealing, you're dealing with those, the, the, the litigation, which in and of itself can, can be pretty expensive and vice versa. If the, Mechanical engineer has a waiver of consequential damages, but for whatever reason, uh, your contract with the owner, you being the architect's contract with the owner, does not have the waiver, then all of a sudden, if it's a mechanical engineering issue that caused the, you know, the underlying dispute, shall we say, which then leads to a consequential damages claim, uh, for which the architect did nothing wrong. It's, all, it's clearly the, the liability of the mechanical engineer, but they have the waiver of of consequential damages, you don't flowing upwards, and now the owner can recover that from the architect. Wow. So that that element of consistency, which is for all contractual provisions, but it's just such an enormous risk with the consequential damages that that's why I, I selected that as one of the three provisions to to look at when you're talking about disputes to make sure that that provision is is you, you either waive it or don't, and, and you do it intentionally, and then you make sure up and down your your contractual chain that it's consistent. Right. So just checking that upstream and downstream flow, making sure that it's that it's all in line, that that if what you just said is, is one of the things I really want to get across to my clients. And I know they know this, but it's it's the way we know things intellectually until they actually happen to us. And then we know them emotionally. Right. Not just what your work is and not just what what you think you're responsible for. That is not the only thing that you can get sued for. Right. In fact, I would argue you are much more likely to get pulled into a very big claim, a very big dispute with what you just talked about. Right. Which is we thought we did everything right on our end, but we didn't check our upstream and our downstream flow. Uh, somebody signed or agreed to something else in contract and by, you know, we, we get pulled in. And I've seen that get ugly really, really quickly. So. Yep, you and I both, and it's the basics. You got to do the basics right. Look at look at those those big significant provisions, and then check for consistency. I mean, it's right. it's easy to say, but you just got to do it. And in, 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 as you're churning out these these projects and, and contracts, you just have to have systems in place to check that uh, in house or outside counsel or, or whoever, because the ramifications of of not doing those those basics right. To your point, uh we've seen it. It's they're, they're significant and potentially very uh, expensive. Right. Right. 
Awesome. Chad, any, any closing thoughts on, on any of the three? Um, anything uh, in closing? No, I think I, I just I just summed it up. It's you, you got to have uh, processes in place to to make sure you, you get it right. You do do what you can at the time of contracting. Um, so so many clients, we, we have so many disputes that come to us uh, in the middle of the dispute and, and said, "Where were you at the time of, of getting your contract done right?" And so it's it's an old story. Um, I've been saying it for years, and yet it, it you know keeps happening but that's yep. that's the way of the world so to the clients that that take the time and and are willing to spend a little energy and a little bit of money to get it right on the, the front end they they see the long-term benefits that's you know we were talking off camera about that um i hope you know this might not be a huge pain point right this moment for a firm but i hope it's something you hear maybe you take some action on it so you know when it's too late it's too late right there's there's not a whole lot we can do when you're in the middle of one of these and, and you've signed a pretty nasty contract so but no, with, with that, Zach, you're doing a great job educating uh, your client base. I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate the invite to come on and talk a, a little construction law for a while. And if you ever need anything else uh, to the, that we want to talk about and, and put out there for people, ha happy to do it. So really appreciate awesome. your, your time and your interest. Thank you so much, Chad. This has been great. Really appreciate it. Yeah, take care. Good, good, uh, good talk. Have, have a good one. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Leadership Blueprint Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.